We're back with another episode of Demon Souls in Design. The only thing left to do is the last level of World 3 and the last level of World 1 in the three last bosses of the game. So let's get right into it. Archstone of the Demon's Fool's Idol. The church devoted to an idol mimicking the queen gave a hope to his prisoners, but the malice behind it will crush their faint solace. So now they're flat out telling us that, you know, this whole world has been a... Uh, is being everyone here is being used for malicious intent and they were using the fool's idol for that purpose i mean that's why the boss is called the fool's idol so a lot of uh, religious commentary here about how religion can be corrupted for malicious intent but there's also a lot of lovecraftian kind of vibe in this level you'll see a little bit of bloodborne on this and i won't talk about too much because i haven't done enough research into shadow tower a previous demon souls franchise but i from what i understand there's quite a bit of shadow tower in this level specifically and also tower of latria in general so now let's see uh, three two of latria so now i talked about how great the atmosphere was in the first level of this world now this is just amazing like those towers the darkness they cast stands out so well you see you can already tell there's some gimmick going on the level. You see those yellow flame, what they look like flames in the distance. You see some weird thing inside that giant tower. Just by the immediate first impression of this level, you can already tell there's really something interesting going on here. So let's continue through. So we see we're on these narrow passageways. Suspended way up high in the air. You can see the ground, which is interesting. We're not just on a baseless cliff you can see like what appears to maybe be items or torches at least down there so the player could realize maybe there is something down there we see gargoyles that start moving on us and we can see some weird looks to be some sort of creature in the sky as i walk over that these gargoyles drop down behind us now these gargoyles, it's actually generally pretty easy to just run past them. Because I will say, here's an interesting thing about Demon Souls. The enemies in this game have actual, like, flight. Like, it's not pre-programmed flight where they just kind of go through an anima animation from one spot to another. It appears they have the actual ability to fly, which is basically just based on pathfinding as if they were walking around, but they can fly in the air. The only problem is it does not work very well. Uh, enemy flying enemies often get stuck on things. They fly in the same. They get stuck in the air. They don't know how to land. I would say it was an ambitious effort on From Software's part to try to have enemies with actual, legitimate flight, but it just doesn't work out that well. And for the worst, these enemies are not designed very well. You can usually just run right past them with little threat, whatsoever. So similar to the first level of this world, the level here has an amazing atmosphere amazing horror kind of vibe but the gameplay unfortunately doesn't really add, stack up to it this is a very long level with not really much going on it's rather boring most of the time which is really unfortunate because the level looks so beautiful in such a dark way and uh oh we missed the elevator and uh yeah it just in the lore of the, the the under the i wouldn't say the lore but the the what you the impressions you can glean from this world that you're in and what's going on are really good it's just great but again it's unfortunate that the gameplay doesn't measure up it really brings it down a lot like we have to wait for this elevator we come up there's a gargoyle there you can kind of casually walk past him he misses you like the enemies are just not designed very well like you don't really even have to try to run past them Like he's right behind me but i'm not too worried about it i'm just kind of going about my business if you kill all these guys as they chant to this giant fire thing, this happens. Some, we broke some chains. Oh, this gargoyle dropped right next to me. And then he's just going to walk away. Okay, he got me. And they do no damage. Like, look at how little damage that is. Once you get... You know, we're at 30 vitality, which is a decent amount, but it's not that much. The enemies start doing no damage whatsoever. Like, that's actually kind of pitiful. Oh, actually, we don't want to use this elevator. Let's drop down here. See what all these lights are about. There's actually a character we want to meet. Drop down here. Are you here? 
here to fight the demons. If so, then help me escape this place. I am on your side. I have come to face the demons. Thank you. I will remember this. I am certain we will meet again. Now, if you play Dark Souls 1, you might be getting some... You might have a feeling like you recognize what's going on here. And you would be correct if you're thinking of Lawtrek. Because, yes, this character is pretty much ex what Lawtrek is based on. You find him trapped. He asks you to help him. And if you help him and leave him free, he will eventually start killing other characters in the game. I will remember this. I am certain we will meet again. So we're going to take care of that. Well, what have we here? Do you wish to die so soon? Unlike Lawtrek, though, he's well, actually kind of a pushover. He, he doesn't even really defend himself. And there you go. But he does drop one of the cooler armor sets in the game. Let's we'll see if we can wear it. Don't think I'll have enough uh, equip load to do so. Nope, can't even wear those. Do we have... Nope, can't wear it. Well, let's see if we can do this. Yeah, it just looks silly. But yeah, that's where Lawtrek's based on. So we'll use the cell he was in to go down. So now how we talk about how you can see the bottom of the level when we first come here, that's where we go now. So it's kind of cool how much verticality is in this level. Again, the atmosphere and design, the level design itself it's pretty good, but it really falls apart because the enemy design is so lacking. But there is a new enemy coming up. Maybe that can change our minds on this. As we get plunged into this weird... Not really a swamp. I'm not sure what this... I guess this is supposed to be some kind of blood. Again, extremely creepy. You know, Lovecraftian, horrific kind of vibe. It's a shame. I really wish this level was, was better. Because it's visually so appealing. And so dark. In, the, in just the right ways. Now we're trying to find a way up. We can see these weird centipede creatures on the path. If we could find a way up. Yeah, unfortunately, I cannot. Yeah, here we go. So here's one of these centipede enemies. Not, and they have fa man, uh, faces of men, which is a. Uh, Again, pretty damn creepy. And we're going to actually find out why that is. So here's a, a bigger one. Now, again, this enemy is really not the best design. You see how it broke apart like that? That's a consistent thing that happens. When their HP gets lower enough, they get cut in half and get staggered for an extremely long time. So what that basically means, as long as you can do about half their health quickly, there's no threat whatsoever. So if you just do decent damage, not even a lot, just decent damage... These enemies are almost no threat. It's actually kind of sad. Like, and they get staggered too. Like, look at how much time you have to finish them off. Again, the enemy design in this level is just really lacking. Like, they're just not, there's not much of a threat. Unfortunately, they're just not much of a threat. And that's kind of the problem with this level in general. It's a big level and it's, and it's a beautiful level, but there's just no real challenge to it. Like, you can just do that. Yeah. It's a real shame. Oh, what's, what are these items over here? Oh, there's dark moon grass here, which is nice. Now, the funny thing is, I think this dark moon grass is intended to be a reward for getting here, because this is a pretty far point in the level. The fog wall indicates that we're getting a lot of we're getting far in it. There's a lot of enemies here. I think that Dark Moongrass is intended to be a reward that you overcame a difficult challenge, but it really doesn't come off that way with how easy these enemies are to kill and get past. So we can keep seeing these weird tentacle things, which eventually the game, again, thematically it's great, because that builds up to a really good climax of the, the world building. So that is one thing I'll praise, and we'll see that shortly. So now we actually see a Black Phantom Mind Flayer. Which has a lot more HP and does more damage than a normal one. But they put this wall here specifically to help you hide from him. Because again, these enemies, we mentioned before, 
are very easy to sneak up on. So I think that was definitely intentional to let you make it, a, you know, an ambush on this guy. And we continue up above. So we're heading back up from the, below, the depths we we're at below. And more of these enemies, which are, again, not much of a threat. You just basically just attack them. You just keep hitting attack and they die. And it's a big change of pace from the rest of the game because normally you're supposed to worry about your position and uh, you can't just mindlessly attack a lot of the enemies. But in this level, you really can do that. You can just run up to these guys and hit them. And there's really nothing much, you know, there's really nothing to worry about. Just kind of run up and hit them. So I just feel like that was just a failure on their enemy design. I don't, I don't know, I don't know how that got past playtesting. Honestly, maybe they thought, I don't know, they needed much more HP if they were going to have that mechanic where they split in half. They're just too vulnerable. So now more gargoyles. But again, the gargoyles are not much of a threat either. Ooh, that did a little bit of damage, but again, not not much to worry about. He's just gonna fly. All right, he's just gonna fly there. Again, the, the enemy design not the best, not the best in this level. He's shooting across at me from the other side of the wall. Yeah, I hate to criticize, like really harp on this, but it's really a down point in the this level. Because I guess the thing that really gets me about this is this could have been such a great level. But it's a, shame, it's a shame to see such ineffectual enemies in an otherwise brilliant level. It really, the contrast really makes it stand out just how bad these enemies are compared to everything else. Because even some of the lesser, even some of the weaker enemies in the game aren't quite this unpolished and unrefined. Like, they, they don't really feel like they are finished, per se. So we see this for the second time. These guys worshipping this chalice with whatever it is. I don't know if it's supposed to be fire magic but we kill all of them And this is where the story threads of, of Tower of Ladger, this whole world, really all come together and it's just brilliant. So there's a giant heart suspended in the air by chains that we knocked down. Again, very similar to Bloodborne, except that was a giant brain you uh, knocked down that was suspended. But the main difference here is the context. So these, the man serpent, the not man serpent, but man centipedes start crawling out of the heart. Now, it's already be much a big enough clue that they have human faces, but the other thing is, remember how the gargoyles brought us here after we beat Fool's Idol? And remember how Fool- wow, frame right, Demon Souls. Uh, remember how Fool's Idol was being worshipped by those prisoners? And these- the, uh, man- the, uh, centipedes had the faces of those prisoners. So what's going on is, the prisoners get brought here in hopes that, you know, they'll be saved or freed. And they end up getting put into that heart and turned into demon and monsters or demons, whatever word. I guess monsters would be more appropriate here. They're being turned into monsters by demons. So that's so they're they're manufacturing the, whoever's in charge here, who we find out later is the old monk, is manufacturing his own like knockoff demons out of regular people. So really twisted, really dark. I, I think it's just great. And the best part about this is we're the next boss we're gonna have to fight is essentially the old monk's greatest creation. Which is similar, they have a similar design to the uh, to the uh, man centipedes, but you know, very, I guess you could, actually it's actually more brilliant than I realized. The boss coming up is basically a combination of a prisoner from the first level, a man centipede, and a gargoyle, all in one. It's a really genius idea. 
So almost every enemy in this level, in this world, is in this boss in some way. Alright, so we don't need solar remains. We'll have turpentine. Now, unfortunately, there is a, a bug I should mention here, because actually, I tried, I'm not trying to go into too many obscure glitches that players wouldn't really know about, but in terms of this boss, there is an important one. So the Thief Ring. You don't want to have it equipped for this boss, because like I mentioned before, the enemies in De Demon Souls that can fly have an actual flight, and that applies to the man -eaters as well. And it can be just as buggy as the Gargoyle's flight, and the Thief Ring can affect it. So if you have the Thief Ring on, there's a chance that the Gargoyles could just leave the boss because they fly too far away from your aggro range. So it's a really bad uh, bug because once that happens, you pretty much have to just do the fight all over again. So that's an unfortunate pro uh, consequence of the not really well programmed flying mechanic of the game. All right, punish, pull through. Now, you probably realize this is very similar to the Gargoyles in Dark Souls 1. Even has a tail cut. Although in this game, the tail cut affects the enemy's moveset. They have attacks with their tail that they need. And it also stuns them for a long time, giving more damage in. We're, yep, we're on a high, a high platform where we can fall off. We're fighting a flying enemy, similar to a Gargoyle. A lot of similarities to Dark Souls 1 Gargoyles. Oh, there we go. Punish that. Roll. So yeah, this is similar. Uh, we talked about how Penetrator and also Flame Lurker were much more straight-up action fights. This is probably the biggest example of that. This is just a straight-up fight. There's no gimmick here. There's no puzzle mechanic. You just have to learn their moveset. Again, this is probably the closest to a Dark Souls boss in this game. They have a pretty elaborate moveset. They have patterns that you have to learn. You have to know your dodge timings. Again, you're on a narrow pathway. So even the environment comes into effect. And just like Dark Souls 1 Gargoyles, once the first one eats low enough on HP, the second one comes out. Uh oh, we didn't kill him. And here comes the second one. Ooh, and that could have been really bad. I'm surprised I didn't get hit there. So my primary thing right now is I just want to kill the one that's already almost dead. Because this is the most dangerous part when you have to deal with both of them at the same time. There we go. And that attack is intended to roll catch you if you try rolling in. And there we go. We try to get the tail cut. It gets us extra damage because of the big stun. I like that use of a tail cut. It's not gimmicky. It's just the way to get bonus damage and to limit their moveset. I don't, I'd actually kind of prefer that as the, just getting a good weapon for it. Because it feels like more of a tangible part of the actual fight. Like prioritizing a certain part to hit them. It's very similar to Bloodborne and how... Certain bosses breaking their limbs can give you more damage openings and whatnot. I think it's really well done. So you can start to learn their their patterns and exploit them. And this is much more of a straight up fight similar to say Dark Souls. Ooh, and that, that roll got me. Okay. Bait that out, punish it. Yeah, they have a much wider... And the thing you might notice, they have a much wider variety of attacks than other, all, all the other bosses in the game. Penetrator are probably the most moves of any of boss so far, and this has much more than that. They have a tackle, two different melee attacks, multiple projectiles. They can fly, shoot, in the, use their projectiles in the air. And there's two of them as well. So this is, fight is... This boss is very different from every other boss in the game, and it's much more... I think that's why a lot of people consider this the hardest boss in the game, because of how much it stands out from all the other bosses. Now we continue in here. We'll put our thief ring back on. And we'll keep those there. And we get a legendary soldier soul and a renowned soldier soul. A lot of people say that maybe this is the corpse that the man eater was based on because you get two soul items from it, but no real way to know. So we continue upwards.
So it might not be too obvious, but the idea is behind this boss is that he summons someone to fight you. And yes, this was the first time in a Souls game where another player could be the boss. And uh, on, the game doesn't have online anymore, at least not on uh, traditional means. But yeah, that was the main idea behind this fight. So it's, and I think it's really interesting that they were so bold in Demon Souls to have one of the... Because again, this could be a player's final boss because the way the game progresses. And that could be of a player for some people. So I think that's really interesting. Well, there are other uh, human, potentially human-like bosses in the other games, like uh, Tower of uh, Mirror Knights can summon players, Half-Light can be a boss. This is one that's probably built up the most. Very interesting. I think that's really bold and innovative, and I'm glad they did that. This is the first game I ever remember anything like that being done. Really cool concept. Now, unfortunately, though, after I said all those praises, unfortunately... When you're not online, the boss that gets summoned in is not very good. Um, they, For whatever reason, the NBC that you fight in the place of a human is really just not effective. He uses some, a really weak weapon, and uh, he doesn't really have a lot of interesting tactics, so I guess we'll see about that. He uses claws, which are a pretty weak weapon in general. He switched to an insanity castler, but he hardly ever uses it, which is really a shame. Because he can cast Firestorm, but he basically never actually does. I'm trying to get a backstab here. There we go. That's pretty much all you have to do. Yeah, he just does that. Not really much to it. Except he does get the homing soul arrows. Again, if you fall half light, you're familiar with that. But again, it doesn't really it doesn't make it much too much more difficult. You just kind of back off for a second, let them shoot. They do. They can do a lot of damage, but they're very easy to dodge. He gets more of them as he gets less HP. Oh, he switched the Insanity Catalyst. He's gonna make me a liar? He's swinging... Wait. <laughs> really, dude? I was really hoping he'd shoot the, the, the Firestorm. But he switched the Insanity Catalyst and still attacked me with the Claws. Well, that's unfortunate. Yeah, and very rarely does he actually shoot that. So his AI is not very good either. As well as having a pretty weak build. Oh, that's gonna be the problem. I should not have attacked there. Okay. Oh. He switched to it again and put it away. And there we go. The old monk is defeated. And another reference people probably realize, the, the head wrap he's wearing is was referenced in Dark Souls 1 by King Jeremiah. So there's a lot of different... Like, so there's Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3... It can all be linked back to this boss and Demon Souls. Yellow Demon Soul. And we're done with World 3. That just leaves 1-4, the last level in the game. Now, I mentioned before how the enemies in Demon Souls... I mentioned it when we fought Penetrator. The, in general, the enemies don't hit very hard. And that's becoming very apparent now that we have 30 Vitality. We're fighting final bosses. We're fighting some of the harder bosses in the game. And they're doing very little damage to us. So yeah, Demon Souls is extremely forgiving. And now... We, uh, damaging the enemies are even just a little bit of vitality again 30 vitality is not that much you know we've put a lot of points in the endurance and strength we're only level 56 i think most right first time players end the game around level 70 or 80 so we're not even that high a level and the enemies are doing very little damage to us and unfortunately the crestfallen knight is gone to get his soul so there you go that's that's the crestfallen tradition so we might as well level up now we still have all, and we had never even used all these boss souls. We'll use our regular ones. And there we go, we'll level up. Guess we'll just get some strength. And more damage, because why not? And we'll repair one last time before doing the last level of the game. Plus eight long sword, that, that, that's probably good enough. I could have gone on my way to get the, at least plus nine or ten even, but I don't think it's really necessary, honestly. Plus eight long sword is perfectly fine. We don't need these. Don't need all these weapons. And all that stuff. There we go. And we might as well keep those. Okay, we're good to go then. Yep. Got 
four soul remains left, that should be good enough. Actually, let's put those here in case we need them. And there we go. Inside Bilterio's gates, where the streets intertwine, the eyes of traps set by the fed official and embodiment of old King Alan's madness. The King's Tower, once a symbol of Bilterio, is now ridden with dragon's claw marks, with only the old king watching all from his broken throne. So there, there you go. The King Alan himself, who the monumental mentions at the beginning of the game. So this is what the game's been building up to. And this level is probably one of the more difficult ones in the game. They kind of throw everything at you in a very tight space. So we're going to see how that plays out. And it's curious that there's a dead dragon here that uh, the knights, the archers are on top of. So it seems, I don't know what the lore implication is here because the other dra the dragons in the game, the red and blue dragon, they seem to uh, obey Alan. So I'm guessing the implication is that this is a dragon that they couldn't tame, so they put it down. But again, I'm not really sure. That's the only thing I could really uh, gather. Oh, he's trying to heal himself. Okay. Ooh, more healing items. They're giving us really good healing items now. So they're kind of preparing us for the end of the game. And more souls. So three black phantoms here. Now, most people have realized that these three black phantoms represent the first three bosses of, of this world. The archer represents Phalanx, the guy with the tower shield represents Tower Knight, and uh, the guy with the penetrating or sword represents Penetrator. So it's kind of an interesting little touch, and I guess you could say this is where the bosses, uh, the demons of those bosses, the people they're based on, where they came from. Yep, yeah, that is the penetrating sword, and he tried to use a penetrating attack, thrusting attack. Now, it's a good idea to kill these guys, because they don't respawn, so once they're dead, you can run through here pretty easily. Yep, you can stunlock them. I mean, there's the penetrating sword. That's one way you can get it. There's actually multiple ways to get that weapon. Now, one thing to keep in mind is soul remains do work on these enemies. We're not going to do that right now, because we don't have that many. It's not necessary. But it is a really easy way to kill them. But if you have a weapon that can stunlock, and you do decent damage, you can just do that. Not too hard to do. Although the Tower Knight guy also has a scraping sphere, which can break our equipment, which makes this much more difficult. But you can circle strafe him. So yeah, the the NPC enemies in this game, not too bad. Oh, that's going to do a lot of durability. He hits pretty hard, though. This guy hits pretty hard. No. He's going to be tur he's gonna turtle up. Maybe we can hit him on wake up. Nope. Yeah, he hits pretty hard. Much harder than the last enemies we've been fighting. Hits way harder than Maneater, even, which is kind of funny. And he's dead. Alright, so those fandoms are taken care of. That's the White Bow, and that is the Tower Shield, I believe. Yep. We don't need these items, but I guess we'll grab them, just for confirmation. So, the first part of this level has been taken out. That part's not too bad. But if you explore a little bit, there are some items over here you're going to want. Summer Emperor can come in handy for body form if you're having trouble with Alan. Although I wouldn't really recommend it, you might just hurt your world tendency, but that's fine. Speaking of that, our world tendency in World 1, and all the worlds it seems are pure white, that's because if you beat bosses in the world, it goes towards white, and it only goes down if you've been dying in body form, which we haven't been doing that much. I haven't talked about world tendency too much because I didn't want to go into too much obscure mechanics that aren't really going to play in the most people's experience in the game. But it is just a thing to check out right at the end of the game. This is the reference it. Chunk of Hearthstone. So this is where the level really picks up. This tower can be extremely dangerous. So we're going to try to play this slow. Now there is a way where you can run through this area. And it's much easier that way once you know what you're doing. But most players are not going to know how to do that. So we're going to do this how most people would probably approach it. Slow and cautious. They might actually threw him on the table. And I could not hit him there for some reason. There, that takes care of him. Full of moon grass. 38 of them. Go up with our shield up. A bunch of archers immediately over our heads. And another one. So yeah, they kind of throwing everything at you here. There's a ninja even that going to try to ambush us. But you can use the train to your advantage. 
So yeah, this level they kind of throw everything at you. A little bit of everything. And then if we continue up ahead. Dual wielding, uh, two handing red eyed knight. But again, if, if you have a, if you can stun lock, that's kind of a thing that makes Demon Souls pretty easy in general. If you do decent damage, you can stun lock enemies down. It makes it much easier. Don't think we're gonna need that anymore. So this dragon can be quite quite a problem if you don't know the best way to go through here. And I will criticize it, in fact, because it's not the most well-designed. It'll be hard to explain without being able to show it, but I'll do my best to show how it kind of works. So right now he's breathing fire on that one section. Now you see these two cornerstones here. He's basically that pathway there between those is where he's breathing fire on. Now he will continue to do that until you get to the next section. Now here's the problem. If I were to run right now and go too fast, he would immediately start breathing fire on the next section because that's where I'm at. Except that will get you killed if you can't take a hit. So un unfortunately, you kind of have to know to go a little slower so that way he doesn't immediately start changing sections. It actually makes this kind of unintuitive. Like, I'm going to slow down right there and then continue. Slow down right here, continue. And the reason to do that is to ensure that he breathes fire on the spot you just passed by and not where you're about to be. I don't think they meant to do it that way, but that's just kind of how it happened. Thankfully, the next section is more logical, more intuitive, although it's very easy to overlook how the next section works. But if you pay close attention, you can see what's going on there. So we continue over here. He switches over there. Now, he's not going to do anything until we get closer. Now watch closely to his fire breath. Now this one, he shoots out. It only breaks the statues closest to us. He shoots this one and it sweeps all the way back and breaks the statues in the far back. So the idea is, is that attack shoots straight out and this attack sweeps back. What that means is, if I ran right now, the next attack would sweep up the stairs and hit me. But if I ran right now, the next shot would go over my head. That's the idea here. You want to run after this one. Because that one, if you run before, it will hit you. Now, I've heard some people say, oh, you run to the, on the right side because he doesn't shoot over there. And that's not, I don't think, the intended mechanic because I see the fire spreading on all sides. Like, I'll run all on the far left where people say not to do that. And it will work just fine. Because I'm going to run after the sweep. Or I'll go too early. Well, we'll try that again. We'll never go too early. So after the sweep, so that's the attack that sweeps up the stairs. The next attack will go over my head. And then we'll be perfectly fine. Now I admit that you have to pay really keen attention to see how that works. But it makes it does actually make perfect sense. And it's, it's pretty simple once you understand it. Oh, it's you, is it? My father is up above. Well, what's left of him anyway? He's transformed into a fiendish demon. I began this quest in a search for truth. But it seems I was a fool to even try. Please, kill my father. In his degenerated state, he can only bring peril to the lands. This key fits the Boletaria Mausoleum. Inside the Mausoleum are my father's two swords, Soulbrand and Demonbrand. Use them to bring an end to this madness. So, it seems like Estrava fought Alant before we got here and did not do so well and succumb to his wounds. And there's blood on this staircase, so I wonder if that's supposed to be Estrava's blood. I'm not sure. 
but it's very possible it is. Although there's more down here, so maybe not. But either way, it seems like that's what happened to Estrava. We couldn't save him this time. Now, I really like Estrava's character because the impression I get of his character is he's the prince. He's supposed to be destined for nobility and greatness. So he has a lot of, he bears a lot of responsibility on himself. But you get the impression he's just not cut out for this. You know, he constantly needs help. He's not, he's not really fit for what he's supposed to do, but he still dedicates himself and tries his best. Regardless of how how ill-fitted he might actually be as a person. But he still feels responsible to do it. And I can respect that. But now we have to fight his uh, Black Phantom. He has Rune Sword and Rune Shield, which does magic damage. So his attacks would ignore our shield for the most part. But, yeah. Estrava. So... <laughs> It's the end of that. Yeah, like I said, the NPCs in this game, not the best. So we're about to fight the final boss. And this elevator right here is great. This is thematic uh, gameplay storytelling. It's been a classic of game design. This goes back to Castlevania, like, 1 and 2 and 3. Where in, like, all the classic Castlevanias, they'll have, like, that final staircase. Actually, I don't think 2, because 2 was not very good. But um, they would have, like, that final big staircase leading up to the boss. That's to build tension. That you're at the final boss. They want to build a little anxiety into you. That's what this elevator is. We can actually see Dreglings controlling the elevator. So it's not magical in nature. So this elevator is purposely slow. Purposely got that, you know, like, that that sound effect of the, machine, of the elevator, like, barely working. They're really trying to build this up. Alright, this is the final boss. Old King Allen, most commonly known as False King Allen. He has a charge that you can punish. Now, here's the main thing with this boss. When you stay close to him like this, he does his most dangerous attacks. That attack especially is very dangerous if you're caught too close to it. Because it can actually be almost impossible to roll through all of it. That's his Soul Drain attack, which actually drains one level from you permanently if you get hit by it. So yeah, his attacks are very fast when you're this close to him, and they hit multiple times. Even blocking them, it seems like considerable amount of damage. Oh, I should not have done that. I should have healed. That's fine. But if you're, as you can see right here, if you're far away from him, you're pretty safe. So basically, the main premise of the boss is keep distance. And he does this attack, which is his giant god's wrath attack, but it leaves him very vulnerable. And he actually takes bonus damage from the first hit from when he's in that state. He actually takes 50% more damage. So he alternates between his dash attack and his god's wrath attack when he's uh, far away from you. And that's pretty much all he'll ever do. So you can re drastically reduce the difficulty of this fight with just a little strategic positioning. Again, more of a puzzle fight, honestly, for Alan. Like, it's not quite as bad as something like, say, you know, uh, old, not old monk, but, uh, Adjudicator, Old Hero, or Storm King. But again, the simple, simply positioning away from him drastically reduces the difficulty of the fight. It actually makes it, honestly, far too easy for the final boss. I would say Man Eaters and Flame Lurker are probably 
better difficulty for where they're placed in the game, and this should be harder. It should be harder than those, but typically he's not. Like, it's pretty simple. And he's gonna keep doing that, and let us do a ton of damage. And again, this is only a plus eight longsword without even that much scaling. And that's pretty much all you have to do. And we'll try fighting him close up again just for the fun of it. Well, even close up, he did that. Well, can roll through that with good timing. Roll through that with good timing. Roll through. He tried to counterattack. That attack can actually be hard to deal with if he does it immediately after getting hit. So you can fight him up close, but it's very much more difficult. But you can. You can outspace that and punish. Do it again. And that's about it for a false king out. For a final boss, honestly, it's a good. I would say it's a good final boss. Again, probably similar to say Penetrator. Probably doesn't hold up all that well compared to modern standards, but it's not terrible. And actually, let's let me show this attack. Again, it has a ton of range, it does a lot of damage, but it's not too hard to deal with. Especially because you can just kill him for it most of the time. So yeah, I would say it's a really good boss, just doesn't hold up all that well. It's definitely not as good as some of the harder bosses of every, pretty much every game on. Again, I love the staging of this fight, I love the music. I love his design. I love the fact that he has like that soul aura at times. I love the state, like the arena you fight him in. I love that he ha he literally has a broken throne, and you can see off into the other earlier levels in the game. I think that's brilliant. But the actual boss itself, maybe not the best. Might not be the best boss. I mean, it's a good boss, but it could be a lot better. I guess we'll finish this now. Wait, can we time this? Nope, and he didn't even hit me. Come on, Alan. Ooh, that was actually pretty cool. Wonder if you can kill him like that. Because he didn't even hurt me for that. No, I'm going to have enough time. Wow, you can just... Wow, it doesn't even hit me. So we're learning something more about the game right now. And there we go. Alright, so now that was the real Alant. The real Alant talking to us. Because I did mention how that boss is kind of referred to False King Alant, and we'll learn why in a minute. Now we're fighting the story final boss. I know what some people might be thinking, but like, you haven't done all the side quests, there's characters you haven't met. The intention of this playthrough was not to do a 100% playthrough, but to more uh, have a uh, general game design look at the game. Not to complete every objective, do every type of thing, but more to analyze the game from a game design perspective. Hark, I hear a voice of yore. The old one is calling for thee. Let us proceed below to its lair.
I have brought thee what thou wishest. Thy new demon. Come now, be good. So you could probably tell from there there's more kind of Lovecraftian influence there. This creature that's, you know, the main, you could say, not the main villain of the game, but the main problem, the main source of the issue, is not a vengeful being. It's, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's like a Lovecraftian god. They don't care for, you know, about, they don't, it doesn't acknowledge the play of humans. It's not doing what it does out of malice. It just does what it does. It's not a, you know, it's an otherworldly being that we can't really understand. Let us proceed below to its lair. And its lair is literally inside its body. And this should look very similar to Beta Chaos, considering we have to, you know, break branches to get inside here. And this creature in Demon Souls creates demons. That's what its whole thing is about. Again, very similar to Beta Cast. So Beta Cast is, you know, very similar to the old one. It's almost, you know, it's almost the same idea. It's very, only slightly changed. You have been chosen by the old one. Shalt thou seek everlasting demon souls? Or obey that naive monumental? Whatever your choice, you are our first visitor. May you be welcome here. So again, we're kind of getting this dialogue that makes us question who to trust. Is the Monumental lying to us? Is the Monumental using us? Or are, or is Alan, the person we're about to meet, been corrupted by the demon soul, similar to like Estrella and other characters? Surely you have seen Suffering that fills this world, the fight poison with poisons, God is merciful, and so created the Old One. The Old One will feed upon our souls and put an end to our tragic realm of existence. So now we finally learn King Allen's motivation for everything he's done. You could say in a lot of ways he may be a nihilist, and this could be a criticism of nihilism. His thought process, thought process is that, you know, life is pain and it's ultimately meaningless because we're going to die anyway. I might as well free everyone from this burden of life because it doesn't matter and kill us all. Now, you can, so in many ways you could say that you're, if you choose to go against him as the character, you're championing the idea that no matter how bad things are, it's always worth fighting. It's always worth trying to make things better. So it's... It might not be the most uh, groundbreaking concept for a of a story, but the way they handle it through gameplay is very well. It's very well done. Because Alan, on one hand, has given up everything for his goal here. He literally used his own flesh to create the, the boss we just beat before. That's why the demon looked like him. You know, Ostrava thought it was actually him, so we know that's actually what Alan used to look like. And this is all that remains of the actual King Alan. He's given up his body and probably a lot of his own soul for his purpose. He sacrificed everything for what he believed was right. And uh, so he also mentioned, you know, you could have everlasting demon souls if you, you know, if you believe me. And that could be reflected in gameplay through the endings. Because a player who wants to just keep playing demon souls, it makes more sense for them to do the bad ending because in the bad ending, you get, you're given more souls. And if you just want to keep playing the game, that's what you do. So you could say the bad ending is for people who agree with Alan and just want to keep killing and just keep enjoying 
the death and destruction, and the good ending could be the opposite. So there's a lot of role playing involved. Get his sword, the soul brand. The soul rending blade passed down to the Bolterian royal family is a black blade that forms a matching set with demon brand. After Alan rose to the throne, it was always in the king's hands. Old King Alan favored the blade for the way its power increased the more demonic the wielder's soul became. Now normally, I prefer the good ending, but for the sake of a game design analysis, we need to do the bad ending. So forgive me for this. sensed a new and powerful demon by its side. And before long, the world will be engulfed by the deep fog. Bring more souls.
So if you played Dark Souls 3, you probably recognize that ending cutscene very similar to uh, the ending in Dark Souls 3 where he steps on the Firekeeper's head just like he stepped on the Maiden's head before doing a bad ending. So even the, one of the last endings of the last Souls game directly references the ending of Demon Souls. And I think with that, we're done with Demon Souls in design. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope maybe explain, maybe learn some things. Maybe, I don't know. I'll see you guys later.